Thanks everyone. Welcome for joining us or rejoining us for Land Reuse Month for our, our final session of the month. We're going to be talking about funding and then we're going to do a short wrap up session as well with Cathy and Gemma from the Land Commission. I'm Emma Cooper. I'm the Head of Land Rights and Responsibilities for the Land Commission. And I'm absolutely delighted to be, be hosting this, this session for Land Reuse Month. So I'm going to start with Charlotte, who's going to present first. Charlotte is a research associate at Ryden. She works predominantly with public sector clients, so absolutely in the right place um, today for the audience, and reviewing their commercial property and land portfolios and providing strategic advice. Charlotte's also been involved in the Vacant Derelict Land Task Force and uh, commission work on Vacant Derelict Land for, for quite some time, helping us to understand the, the, the funding landscape out there as well as other things. Charlotte, I'll pass over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just um, share my screen. Oh, that's okay for everyone. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I just wanted to do a very brief um, introduction on myself and Ryden, if that's okay. Um, we're property consultants and we're headquartered in Scotland. We're focused on Scotland and I am part of our quite small and specialist um, research team. We, um, as Emma kind of mentioned, we originally started working with the Scottish Land Commission about three years ago um, when the Vacant and Derelict Land Task Force was created and we wrote the baseline document which analysed all the vacant and derelict land in Scotland. We also provided support to the task force and in 2019 um, I produced the initial review of funding sources for vacant and derelict land. And earlier this year, the Land Commission asked me to update this piece of work, which was keen to do as what we've seen in the last few years um, has been a massive change, um, to say the least, in the funding landscape in Scotland. So, um, yeah, let's dive in and take a look at what we found. One of the most significant changes to the funding landscape has been Brexit, which means obviously that um, Britain's no longer el eligible for any of the EU structural funds, which the Scottish Government previously managed. This has affected funding sources, which we included in the previous reviews, um, things such as Spruce, Leader. Um, however, the UK government has made a commitment to fully replace European funding levels and has introduced several new funding streams which are applicable to the whole of the UK. Um, this also means um, sort of a byproduct of that is that Westminster is now much more actively involved in economic development in Scotland than it was the case previously. So I've listed some of these new funds here. Um, I won't go into detail on all of these, but um, the first awards for the levelling up fund were announced at the end of last year, and that included um, 16 and a half million to Edinburgh Council for the Granton gas holder project. And that seeks to unlock the wider regeneration of that area. And um, so a prominent sort of vacant and derelict land area. Um, meanwhile, the Community Renewal Fund, which is the precursor to the Shared Prosperity Fund, awarded £75,000 to East Ayrshire Council to create a reuse hub in New Cumnock. Again, that's within a prominent sort of vacant building in their town centre. And whilst many of these funds, they don't directly target vacant and derelict land, they do tend to focus on areas where there is the greatest economic need. So as we know, that tends to correlate with higher levels of vacant and derelict land. The second most significant change has been the policy landscape in Scotland, which has also moved on in the last three years. I don't think anyone could have missed that there is now an increased focus on things like net zero um, and other agendas becoming more prominent. And um, there's much greater emphasis on the place principle, community wealth building, um, natural capital, um, and the Scottish Government has opened up new funding in these areas. Um, and many of its partners have also um, realigned their grant programmes as well. This includes West Lothian Council, which is using its allocation from the Scottish Government Place-Based Investment Programme to deliver on community wealth building and provide funding for its local food bank to create a market garden on derelict areas within its industrial estate. In addition, Nature Scots We Forest Programme looks at creating, well, we forests, but um, they are sort of tennis court size forests um, in urban areas, again, often on areas of vacant and derelict land. The pandemic has also affected the funding landscape. A number of funders had to change their objectives to simply maintain business as usual. And a number of one-off emergency funds were created by the government to keep various parts of the economy afloat. This included extra money being put into funding schemes such as the Town Centre Capital Fund, which can be used to repurpose vacant buildings. 
It also affected funding from sources such as the Lottery and um, Creative Scotland. Um, and depending on the output of a vacant and dialect land project, these have been sort of important funding sources previously. More positively, though, um, a good introduction has been into the funding landscape has been the creation of the £50 million vacant and derelict land investment programme, which was introduced following recommendations by the task force. So 10 projects were announced in the first rounding round and awards ranged from £84,000 to £1 million. And projects there included the creation of a new um, riverbed and riverside green space on derelict land in Barhead, transforming a derelict site in Easterhouse into a wildlife habitat and a new active travel hub on a derelict site in South Lanarkshire. This new fund is available to all local authorities and now operates in addition to the vacant and derelict land fund, which targets the five local authorities most affected by the issue. So moving on to cons further consider some of the funding sources, our review looked at both direct and indirect funding sources. So the latter obviously depends on what the land is being used for, not just that it's purely you know, vacant and derelict. So there is funding available generally for a full range of pro productive outputs, and that includes um, some of the things I've listed there. So infrastructure, housing, commercial development, greening, community uses, and so on. Um, I've already touched on some of these with previous examples, but I think it's maybe worth saying just a little bit more about housing. Um, now the Scottish Government obviously aims to deliver 100,000 affordable homes by 2031-32, and its housing budget dwarfs many of the other areas we traditionally fund vacant and derelict land projects from, such as regeneration. Um, the affordable housing supply programme will share 3.2 billion over five years amongst councils in Scotland, and therefore where housing can be created on vacant and derelict land um, there's a substantial opportunity there. There is additional funding available via the Housing Infrastructure Fund, which helps fund exceptional infrastructure costs. Again, this can cover things um, like contamination, land remediation, and these things are obviously often associated with vacant and derelict land. The fund has been used at good effect at Hamilton Hill, which is one of Glasgow's key regeneration areas where there's been um, mass tenement demolitions leaving large areas undeveloped. So funding will allow for infrastructure works, which will um, provide over 600 new homes to be delivered in the area. Funding levels do vary dramatically um, between funds as you would expect. Um, a further multi-million pound funding budget worth mentioning is the city region and regional growth deals. So a number of these are targeting particular regeneration infrastructure or enterprise um, plans, which is in turn having an impact on vacant and derelict land. A number of the city deals include land reclamation to improve the supply of land for small and medium sized businesses. An example of this is Eden Campus, which is part of the Tay Cities deal and aims to transform the former paper bill site um, in Guardbridge. Continue innovation centre focusing on spin out companies from the University of St Andrews. At the other end of the scale, there are also smaller scale community focused funders. These include many of the philanthropic funds, I always struggle to say that, um, such as the Garfield Weston Foundation, Robertson Trust, Hugh Fraser Foundation, those kinds of um, funds. Um, crowdfunding and community shares are also becoming increasingly popular. As with our previous review, it's still apparent that many projects need multiple funding sources to allow them to come to, uh, to, come to fruition. Funders are looking to spread their risk, often with decreasing funds, which can mean that self-generated income is becoming increasingly important. Funding available from lotteries, trusts and foundations and the UK and Scottish Government may appear extensive. However, competition can be intense and strict criteria and objectives do apply. For those seeking funds, um, it's a no-brainer. Research and preparation are key. Funders often have firm deadlines for submitting applications and therefore projects need to be planned well in advance and may need to embed flexibility as funding sources change. Fundraising can often feel like a full-time job um, and therefore it's important to note that both capital and revenue funding for projects is available. Revenue funding is particularly important for some community projects where local capacity building is required or where further works may need to be undertaken in the feasibility of a proposed project. Funding is available to a wide range of applicant organisations, including local authorities, charities and community organisations. However, there are funding gaps in particular. This includes um, private landowner, uh, landowners of long term derelict sites, whether they be individual owners or private organisations. 
there's a number of options here which are being considered and could include, for example, incentivising the reuse of sites and former buildings by introducing additional relief on rates and council tax, that kind of thing. And I know there's a paper recently pu published by the Land Commission looking at um, reforms in that area. Well, this is the um, sort of summary guide that we've produced. Um, our actual report itself goes into quite a lot of detail on all the applicable funds. However, we've also produced this summary table as a more kind of user-friendly resource, um, which obviously summarises the funding currently available for vacant and derelict land. You can find this in the appendix of our report, which is available on the Land Commission's website, and I've linked it here if the slides are going to be sent around. It's worth noticing, noting that um, funding sources are changing constantly, um, particularly at the moment, and this report captures sources as at March 2022. But obviously, when funding your, your own project, a full exploration of potential sources should be undertaken. As I've spoken about already, a lot has happened in the last few years, and many of the funders we mentioned in our previous review have tweaked or overhauled their programmes, and this is likely to continue as we move forward. However, the guide will give a good starting point and signposting to the various sources for any organisation or group looking to get started. And I think um, that's me. So um, thank you everyone for listening um, and to the Land Commission for having me and I'll pass back to Emma. I think we're going to pick up questions at the end, I think. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Charlotte. <laughs> that was excellent. Thank you. Um, a really helpful overview of the, the funding landscape as it is. You'll be able to see in the chat that the link to the full report is, is available there and you can have a look at that at your, at your leisure to review if there's anything that might be of use to you. Our next speaker is Amy, Amy Mack, um, who is uh, the Regional Engagement Manager with Crown Estate Scotland, um, working in the North East in particular. Amy is responsible for developing business and strategic relationships with stakeholders, clients and communities that help Crown Estate Scotland to achieve its purpose um, of investing in property, natural resources and people to generate lasting value in Scotland. Amy, I can see that you're with us. Are you ready to present? Yeah, great. Thank you. Great. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, OK, thanks very much, Emma, for that um, introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm Amy. Um, I recently joined uh, Crown Estate Scotland in this new regional engagement role. Um, and I thought it'd be useful. I'm going to quickly summarise who we are and what we do, um, as I think that will be useful context um, to our investment priorities. And then tell you a bit about our capital investment funds, um, which uh, might be of interest either directly to some of you on the call or perhaps um, among some of your networks or contacts. So, um, a bit about us. Um, the Scottish Crown Estate is essentially an estate in land. Um, it includes pretty much all of the seabed around Scotland, out to 12 nautical miles, um, covering leasing for things like fish farming sites, aquaculture, cables and pipelines. Um, and it includes the property rights to offshore renewable energy and gas and uh, carbon storage out to 200 nautical miles. Uh, so that includes the big offshore stuff um, being developed as part of the Scotland leasing round. Um, but in practice, a lot of what we do is closer into land uh, on our coastal estate, uh, where we manage about half of the foreshore around Scotland. So um, ports and harbours, uh, moorings, uh, marine tourism, supply chain development related to renewables um, are all relevant areas. Um, and the coastal estate is, is really important um, for us as well, uh, because it's where we interact with, with people and communities and, and businesses. Um, we also have four rural estates, um, and these include things like um, agricultural, uh, residential and commercial properties and forestry. Um, so yes, that is the Scottish Crown Estate, and Crown Estate Scotland is the public corporation tasked with managing the Scottish Crown Estate. Um, so we are a public body and, and a property management organisation really, um, and our remit very much um, includes a strong people and place focus alongside the property remit. So um, as an organisation, we, we have these strategic objectives. Um, basically, our job is to, to make the most of the estate. Um, and we do so in ways that also seek to 
enhance the, the wider impact or wider value. So, you know, whether that's environmental, social, regenerative, um, wider economic benefits to Scotland. Um, we do have some statutory limits around what we can and can't do. Um, so we can only invest in estates um, in land, for example. Um, and that's because we have a remit that is um, a kind of financial at its core. We are a commercial public body, so um, we have to maintain the, the capital value of the estate and seek to enhance it. And we also have to enhance the revenue that it generates. Um, and the capital and revenue, those two things are, are separate because the capital technically belongs to the Institute of the Monarch, but the revenue profit each year um, goes to the Scottish Government, um, to the Scottish Consolidated Fund, um, to be redistributed around coastal local authorities for community benefit projects. Um, so we've got four roles um, at, at the bottom there, and I'll just focus in on the investor role. So as part of that investor role, um, we are looking to deploy capital. Um, our corporate plan outlines an aspiration to commit up to £70 million of capital investment across Scotland by 2023. Um, and as part of that, we have around £9 million allocated to capital investment challenge funds. Um, so we have three funds currently running. The, the boat-based tourism fund and the local partnership fund um, are closed now to new applications. Um, so we've been through the initial application stage with those and successful applicants are currently preparing strategic outline business cases. Um, and we've received you know, a range of applications from local authorities, businesses and um, development trusts. Um, but the Innovation with Natural Resources Fund has just launched a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that's open to new applications. So the Innovation with Natural Resources Fund is really aimed at uh, supporting green business growth and development. Um, it's aimed at projects that have some element of novelty and which promote improvements in um, the sustainable use of natural resources. Uh, so that might include um, the development of new practices in farming or aquaculture or investments in green energy or waste reduction. Uh, which enable more efficient use of natural resources. Um, so projects um, might involve investment in existing um, or new buildings and infrastructure um, or projects which allow businesses to adapt to reduce their carbon footprint um, or cope with climate change, um, improve energy efficiency or, or increase biodiversity. Um, and the size of the investments are between um, 150 and 500,000 um, pounds. And we're keen to attract applications from, from projects at any, any stage of development. Uh, just briefly on investment criteria. Um, as I mentioned, we're looking for sort of projects really that link to the Scottish Crown Estate. Um, we can only make capital investments where we own the underlying title, um, but we can acquire land and property to become part of the estate. So the fund is suited to, to existing tenants and, and also to prospective tenants um, where investment is in, in new assets or property uh, might be required. Um, and we don't actually have to own th the land or asset in perpetuity, we can, we can sell as well. So we can look at purchasing with a view to capital buyback um, by the tenant over a period of time. Um, in terms of financial return, these, these are investment funds rather than grant funding. So we are seeking to generate a, a revenue return um, through either an existing or a new lease. Um, I mean, we would expect that to have a, a sort of positive um, internal rate of return. Um, in terms of value, I mentioned um, we need to maintain the capital value of the investment. Um, and, and finally, the, we're looking for sustainable development. So, um, you know, for example, we'd expect any project to align with what's happening locally and, and contribute towards um, those local, um, regional, um, environmental and economic plans. Um, and also partnership projects as well are, are very much welcome. So I'll just finish with um, a couple of very quick examples of eligible projects um, as sort of food for thought. Um, in terms of um, sort of new sustainable technologies, um, a local cooperative, um, perhaps led by a community group or a business, um, wants to create a vertical allotment to grow um, and sell fresh produce locally. So the INR fund could invest in the purchase of the brownfield site um, required and, and the vertical farm infrastructure. 
um, linking to uh, climate change and, and um, CO2 reduction. Uh, a tenant farmer wants to diversify their, their business by developing a tree nursery. And the INR fund could um, provide investment in the construction of greenhouses and facilities to support the new venture. Um, and in, in terms of, um, sort of energy use and marine energy use, um, a marine-based business or a community energy trust uh, wants to deploy a small-scale tidal device or um, maybe invest in hydrogen infrastructure to bring extra energy resilience to their, to their enterprise um, and support that transition to, to green energy sources. Um, so the INR fund can invest in land and, and buildings um, for associated infrastructure as part of the overall investment required. Uh, in terms of time scales for the INR fund, um, the expression of interest stage closes on the 3rd of June. Um, we then progress to sort of stage two with a strategic outline business case. And, and then based on sign up on that, we would progress to a full business case. Um, and stages two and three um, are essentially based on treasury green book criteria. Um, and yeah, there's full details for, for how to apply um, for that fund on our website um, and my email address is there for any direct follow-ups um, and I suppose yeah just one final point to highlight as well is that you know we can look at other investments out with these capital investment funds and if there's a sort of clear strategic fit so you know I'd welcome any follow-up conversations in that regard and um, if anyone has any specific projects in mind um, yeah that's all for me thank you Thanks, Amy. That was really helpful. Okay, um, I'm going to hand over now to Fraser Gibson. Fraser works for Historic Environment Scotland and is currently a grants team leader based in Edinburgh. He's involved in the delivery of a range of projects across Scotland which support heritage-led regeneration, including capital works um, addressing historic fabric repairs, area-based regeneration, skills training and site understanding and interpretation. Really looking forward to, to hearing from you this morning, Fraser. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I will just now share my screen as well. Hopefully that will work. No problem. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I'd just like to give an overview of Historic Environment Scotland funding, which is available, provide some examples of HES supported projects and look at the objectives and priorities for funding. Um, so Historic Environment Scotland has distributed around 14 million grants per year uh, since it was established in 2015 uh, using grant and aid provided by the Scottish Government. We're currently updating our grant programmes to ensure that our grants approach meets the needs of applicants and grantees and is aligned with current policies and priorities. I'd like to highlight two funding programmes which may be of interest, the Heritage and Place programme and the Historic Environment Grant. Um, so the Heritage and the PLACE program uh, is for area-based regeneration projects and builds on the success of the Conservation Area Regeneration Scheme, or CARS, um, as it was known. Uh, between 2007 and 2020, the CARS scheme awarded over £52 million to 73 schemes in 69 conservation areas, contributing to the repair of over 1,200 historic buildings. This supported the delivery of wider outcomes relating to traditional skills, training and community engagement. The new Heritage and Place programme aims to continue this work and contribute to the development of vibrant and sustainable places in Scotland through community-led regeneration of the historic environment. The programme supports development and delivery of heritage-focused schemes within conservation areas or distinct heritage areas with local authority recognition. The programme supports a combination of activities, including the repair and reuse of historic environment assets, training to strengthen local traditional skills and building capacity within communities to value and look after their historic environment in the longer term. The programme is due to launch on the 30th of March this year uh, with guidance and examples, so keep an eye on our website for more information. The his Historic Environment Grant uh, will be launching in late 2022 um, and support grants for one-off projects involving repairs, training, outreach, and other activities relating to Scotland's historic environment. This means that projects can apply for capital and activities costs under one program, rather than the two separate programs that will replace the Historic Environment Repair Grant and the Historic Environment Support Fund. 
Under the previous Historic Environment Repair Grant programme, funding offers can range from £10,000 to £500,000 and support conservation standard repair works with, which secured the original fabric of historic buildings and ancient monuments using traditional skills and materials. Um, so this year we're also introducing a new set of grants priorities to guide investment. These priorities link directly to our corporate plan and outline what we would like to achieve with our funding in six key strategic areas. Um, so first up, uh, increasing understanding. Uh, this outcome is about providing people with more opportunities to engage with and learn about the historic environment. Uh, so that could be delivered through activities such as volunteering, learning programmes or events such as open days. Uh, there's a focus on engagement with new audiences or activities which increase the diversity of people who engage with this environment and provide opportunities for young people. Um, enhancing communities use uh, through placemaking. Uh, delivery of this outcome should enable communities to participate actively in decisions about their local historic environment and prioritise investment. It could be bringing redundant buildings back into use to provide facilities for local groups or improving the way that heritage assets are used. Examples could also include skills or knowledge relating to maintenance being developed through project delivery or capacity for community groups to manage heritage assets being improved. Um, strength and resilience, this priority will be delivered through projects which focus on conservation repairs, ideally through comprehensive repair projects, although some interim repair or protective measures for heritage at risk can also be considered. For example, projects with appropriate use of traditional materials and minor adaptions to reduce the side effects of climate change or the creation of management and maintenance plans. Uh, climate action, uh, delivery of this priority may be through repair of historic building to make it weather resistant, maximizing its ener energy efficiency and protecting it. Making use of existing historic environment assets will help reduce other carbon intensive outcomes like new construction. Where appropriate sympathetic reinstatement and retrofitting of energy efficiency measures can be included as part of a comprehensive repair project. Uh, so for skills um, to achieve this priority, a project will help address key skills gaps, such as those identified in the skills investment plan for Scotland's historic environment. This could be delivering targeted skills development opportunities such as apprenticeships or volunteer training, particularly where there can increase the diversity of the historic environment workforce and lead to positive employability outcomes, particularly focusing on young people. And uh, increasing economic benefits. Uh, this could be by bringing vacant historic buildings back into productive use and through that end use, encouraging enterprise and creating new jobs. This could also be delivered by the use of local skills and materials in the supply chain for a grant aided project. The project may uh, also generate income from local businesses by attracting new visitors to the area. So a project should maximise benefits for local communities, whilst also managing the impact of changes such as increased tourism. Um, so let's have a look at some uh, examples. Um, this is an example which was of a project under the Historic Environment Repair Grant. Uh, this is Gearloch Heritage Museum. Um, this was a former anti-aircraft operations room in Gearloch. Uh, it was no longer in use and was surplus to requirements of the council and was the subject of a community asset transfer. There was strong local community and volunteer support for the project and the building has been redeveloped to create a cultural, social, economic and educational hub for the community. Uh, the museum delivers by producing, uh, by providing a permanent home for the artifacts, artifacts and collections that have been collected from the 1970s onwards and which showcase the history, culture and natural heritage of the area. The restored building also provides a community space for events, a shop and cafe and creates a, a focal point for tourism. Uh, moving on, uh, this is also a uh, Historic Environment Repair Grant project. This is the Corn Exchange in Dalkeith. Uh, it was designed in 1853 and at the time was the biggest indoor grain market in Scotland. Uh, prior to work starting, the building was empty and on the building's at risk register. Um, the building has been brought back into use as a home for the local housing association who act as an anchor tenant and through the uh, conversion to open plan office space. The building also provides a community space and a town museum. This was a key building as part of the broader continued regeneration of the town, uh, with a CARS funding also being invested in Dalkeith. Um, so moving on to uh, the Heritage in Place programme, um, 
but as this isn't launched yet, uh, these are examples from uh, CARS or Conservation Area Regeneration Scheme projects. Um, so this is Mabel, um, which is a, a current CARS project. Uh, the Mabel Regeneration Project is a partnership between Mabel Community Council and South Ayrshire Council. Uh, the project will provide investment in aim to address buildings which are vacant, underused and or in poor condition. Um, the High Street for many years has been the main access route for large scale lorries to and from the ferry in Stranraer. This has had a detrimental effect on the condition of the buildings and on people wanting to shop in the town. With a, a new bypass which is opened this year, it provides an opportunity to make the town centre a more attractive place to visit, live in and spend time. Um, HES funding will support capital projects, including Mabel Castle, the Town Hall and sections of the High Street. This is an example of one of the early completed projects. Uh, it will also support uh, an activity programme, which includes opportunities to learn traditional building skills, encouraging young people into the construction industry. It will also aim for local businesses to work with the project and develop apprenticeships. Other engagement activities include a range of talks, workshops and volunteering opportunities. And just to wrap up, I wanted to uh, provide an example of a uh, CARS project which is completed. So this is uh, Campbelltown. Um, this delivered repair works to over 40 buildings with a total spend of over £10 million over two rounds of support. Uh, 2,000 square metres of vacant floor space was brought back into use. 60 local contractors were involved and 42 shop fronts were improved. Uh, the town hall, which you see here, um, was uh, regenerated and created a new venue suitable for a wide range of civic, social and community activities. The refurbishment uh, provides a community hub with multifunction event and performance venue, offices for rent, conference and meeting facilities, and a one-stop shop for accessing services for local organisations and community activities, such as weddings and conferences. And uh, the old schoolhouse was also uh, a project delivered through Campbelltown Cars. Uh, this is located on Big Kiln Street and was uh, a building which was empty and at risk uh, and has been brought back into use as a bunkhouse, providing budget visitor accommodation for backpackers looking to explore the area. Um, so if you're Looking for more information on the, the grants refresh or the, the programmes, uh, this is available on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Fraser. That was a, a really interesting overview of the, the grant funds you've got on offer, but also some you know, concrete examples of projects that are going as well. Um, I'll encourage you to, to pop that link from your presentation onto the into the chat if you're able to do that at some point during the discussion this morning. Okay, so we've got um, not very long, just 10 minutes or so for questions for our panelists. Um, and I'd really love to, to hear, hear what your questions are in the audience, but um, I have a couple myself as well. Um, but, oh, I see we've got one. So I'll start with that um, and I'll ask Amy to, oh, so the, the question is, how much funding is there for non-capital projects, e.g. project officers? Um, who would like to come in on that one? Um, I, I could start and, and just say that, yeah, um, I, I suppose as part of our um, enabling role, we, we also fund um, uh, project officer roles. We've got a number of them um, around the country, often sort of conjunction with um, joint funding with local authorities or the enterprise agencies. So um, it's sort of as and when a, a relevant project arises that, you know, we, we then look at um, you know whether that's something that we can fund so um yeah se separate to our capital investment there's um definitely that sort of enabling um funding and uh, and alongside that we also sort of do funding around um research to look at sort of de-risking uh sort of relevant sectors as well um so yeah thanks amy i guess people can get in touch if they want to explore that with you um in any more detail great thank you um, Fraser, I don't know if you want to come in on this at all from um, Yes, uh, I was just going to say that um, as part of the, the CAR scheme, which, uh, as I was saying, was moving to the Heritage in Place programme, um, as part of delivery, there, there would be funding for uh, project officer roles. Um, so usually these are schemes which are delivered in partnership with uh, local authorities and, and, and there is uh, a funding uh, as part of a bid from the, the local authority that would be included for project officers. 
Thank you. It's so important to have those enabling roles, as you say, isn't it, to, to actually bring things together and, and make it happen. Charlotte, thinking about the, the wider landscape, what, what's the kind of pattern that you're seeing there in terms of um, capital funding and then that, that kind of non-capital support for projects as well? Yeah, I mean, I'd say there's been an increase in the amount of revenue funding that's kind of become available. I think a lot of funds recognise that that is something that's required as you're sort of, you know, you know getting your project up to, you know, in the, in the development stage. Um, I think the Investing in Communities Fund um, now offers revenue funding. There's a few others um, that are in the guide as well. So I would say it's something that um, there, you know, is, is there's more attention being paid to the fact that that's required and it's not just, you know, capital alone. Um, it's not enough to get a lot of these projects off the ground. Thank you. Is the, is the table you've put together searchable in, in that way? Yes. In terms of, yeah. Yes, when, I think so. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. The certainly the report is. You can just search for revenue. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I, I've been thinking that, you know, in an ideal world, we would be creating a strategy for our areas and we'd be thinking about the most important things, prioritising them, putting projects together and then finding the funding which, which matches that. But of course, organisations will respond to funding opportunities, which means that the funders have that opportunity to, to shape the landscape of what's actually kind of happening on the ground. In terms of what you'd like to see, and if, if organisations attending today, mostly public sector organisations, want to put themselves in the best position to access funding, what are the key things that they should be thinking about to get themselves and their projects ready for thinking about where to access the best kind of funding? And if I start with Fraser and then move on to Amy and then come back to Charlotte for a kind of overview. Yeah, thanks, Fraser. Sure. Uh, I think... Um... What's really key is having a, a kind of clear vision for the, the kind of project that you want to, to deliver um, and, and having a, a good background and, and have it reasonably well developed. Um, and that can usually mean that you have done a, a reasonable amount of research into uh, what it is you want to deliver and, and how it's going to be delivered. Um, I think one of the key things at the moment is, is being able to uh, access funding from a, a range of funders and um, so it really has to be something which is going to deliver uh, quite a range of outcomes um, and as, as well as uh, by having additional match funding in place it uh, can it reduce risk for any one individual funder. Thanks Razor. Um, Amy? Um, yeah I suppose yeah similar to Fraser it is, it is good to have a uh, quite a well-defined project but it doesn't have to be but um it does it does help to see whether or not that aligns with sort of our investment criteria but you know we're keen to work with people to help them develop those um business cases you know we're on hand to to do that but yeah i suppose um you know sustainable development is at the forefront of our sort of um the sort of corporate plan that we work within and the different statutory um things we work within so um i think you know, people on this call will be very keyed into that, you know, coming from the sort of <laughs> um, public and local authority sector and um, you know, making sure that they're linking in with what is happening locally in terms of the wider plans um, is, is, is really useful. So, yeah. Thanks, Amy. Charlotte? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with everything that um, Fraser and Amy just said the only other thing that I would I would probably add is um consideration about you know the kind of ongoing running of of the project so while there is quite a lot of you know capital funding available to whether it's you know regenerate a building or whatever that might be depending on what you're putting in that building and um, whether it's a community hub or food bank you know you know whatever it might be and um, how you're actually going to fund that project you know after some of these you know the capital grant um, has, has been spent, you know, the ongoing costs year on year and um, just more thought into the actual business plan of the project, you know, rather than just the, the capital project, which is where it starts. Absolutely. And showing that long term sustainability is absolutely, absolutely key. Thank you. I don't know if anybody wants to come back on any of that or add anything else. OK. So another question I had was, what role do you see for local authorities and public bodies to support communities with funding? And if I go to Amy this time and then Charlotte and then Fraser. 
Yeah, it's, I suppose it's that kind of working together thing again as well to support communities. And I think what's been talked about earlier on the call is getting community input early on to understand you know, what's what's needed. Um, but yeah, just just thinking about an example of um, where we're working with you know vacant and derelict land. We we purchased a site quite recently at Montrose. It's a big ex airfield site um, uh, with a view to developing that into a sort of a clean green sort of business hub, really. Um, so we're working really closely with with Angus Council and with Dundee and Angus College to look at you know um, the sort of pipeline of, of skills and jobs opportunities that could come from from those businesses that develop there um so yeah i suppose it's that's that's the sort of the partnership kind of communication point really and, and making sure that the community and the different community organizations are involved in that um yeah not sure if that answers the question but <laughs> i think that's a good start thanks amy <laughs> okay um charlotte um i think the there's more money now for you know you've got now got the place-based investment program which obviously focuses on community wealth building so i know where a lot of, of that money has been given to local authorities they are um you know opening that up for communities to apply for funding through budgets like that but i think the more examples of that kind of partnership working um you know or where something can't be led by community it's at least done um, in consultation with them, I, I think that's only positive for for the way that funding is going and the way that priorities are going across Scotland. Absolutely, and, and two key things that that keep coming up again through Landry Youth Month, really around collaboration and community engagement, and how we do both of those things, you know, most effectively. Fraser, I'll come to you. Yeah, I'm just going to say something similar as well. It's just the the. the really the, the community should be at the, the forefront of, of leading these kind of projects where possible. Um, and I guess the role of the uh, local authorities is to um, support that um, and to provide the, the skills maybe where there's, there's those that are lacking in the, the local community so that the decisions that are being made are informed by the communities, but supported uh, in terms of skills and delivery by the, the, the local authorities. Very helpful, thank you. Um, I'm going to wrap up now and invite Cathy and Gemma to, to join us in just a moment. But first, just want to say a um, very sincere thank you to the panellists for joining us this afternoon slash morning and, um, and helping us to, to understand better what the funding landscape is out there. So thank you very much for, for giving up your time today and coming to chat to us. I'm sure a few people will be in touch with questions and ideas and, and projects and uh, funding applications too, no doubt. Thank you. No worries, thank you. Thanks. So Cathy and Gemma have been involved in Landry Youth Month um, the whole time and also behind the scenes getting together the various resources for people that you've used today and coordinating speakers along with the, the rest of the team of course. But Cathy you've been involved in the Vacant Derelict Land Task Force from the very beginning and Gemma you've been working particularly on the community wealth building guidance that we've, we've looked at today in particular. So I just wanted to start um, by asking uh, Cathy in particular, it's been two years since the Vacant Dirty Land Task Force recommendations. What progress have we seen and where are the barriers for us to, to focus on next, do you think? Thank you. And again, thanks to all the speakers today. It's been, a, it's been an amazing um, morning and full of lots of inspiration and practical ways to take these things forward. But um, really just reflecting on the work of the Vacant Derelict Land Task Force. So this was a group of um, 30 stakeholders from the private, from public and third sector that was coordinated by the Land Commission and SEPA. And I think we really saw there the, the benefits of taking a sort of holistic approach, a strategic approach to tackling vacant derelict land not only the existing sort of stock of VDL, but also looking at how we prevent a new legacy for, of VDL from being created. And that required policy, um, legislative and practical approaches to, to do that. And I think what we've really learned over the last four weeks um, is that there's a lot of really good stuff happening on the ground um, that we can learn from. And I think that for me has been a really interesting experience, I think, sort of learning and getting into the nitty gritty of what local authorities in the public sector are doing 
um, I think is going to be really helpful moving forward because policy processes do take time. Um, and we have seen some amazing developments um, as a result of the VDL task force report and recommendations, particularly around funding. So the vacant direct land investment program, um, which was mentioned just today, but also we had a session in week one, which focused on um, sort of the additionality of this fund and what they're looking for. And actually it's all about um, sort of local authority led applications, but really reinforcing collaboration, working with communities and a wide range of partners um, to deliver that. So that was a major outcome um, for the task force and, and its recommendations. And I think in regards to the Land Commission's work, I think there's some sort of key takeaways there. So we highlighted the barriers and opportunities in the in the report, but I think there's certainly questions around sort of ownership. Um, things that the Land Commission has obviously started to address through the Community Ownership Route Map, which we published as part of week two of Land Reuse Month. Um, we're also working on land for housing and I think the public interest-led development approach, which I think we touched on in all weeks, but really looking at how the public sector can coordinate and, and lead action on, on making direct land, de-risking sites and being the enabler essentially. I think that's a really big opportunity for us to take forward. And also this idea of stewardship and actually rethinking land as, a, as Rachel so well put this morning, it's, it's sort of a shared resource rather than thinking about it in a binary terms of ownership and use. And actually let's think about this as a shared resource and making more of it. Um, and I think another key opportunity, and then I'll stop, um, is, is really the enabling capacity and sort of community-led regeneration. So Carleen from the Development Trust Association of Scotland really referred to her role in, in, in supporting communities and sort of being a, being a broker between local authorities and communities and actually getting communities at the table from the very beginning is a really key part to land reuse. So I think the commission has a role in sort of pulling that together and, and um, providing that confidence and tools to do that. Thanks, Cathy. Hopefully Land Reuse Month has helped us all move a bit forward with things with that sharing of practical ideas, as you say, and examples that are happening, new networking and contacts that people have made and, and the resources that we've that we've shared. Gemma, I'll start with you, but I want to hear from both of you. What do you think are the key things that you want people to take away from Land Reuse Month? And it would be great to hear from people in the chat as well about the things that they think have been, have been kind of key lessons or key messages that they've picked up throughout the month um, through participating. Gemma. Thanks, Emma. Um, I think we were having a really good chat in one of our coffee breaks um, today about um, the, the level of activity that's going on and, and also the fact that there are so many great things, as we've seen over the last month, that we can learn from. Um, and um, we had a bit of a chat about not reinventing the wheel. Capacity and resources can be really constrained. And, and it's important uh, to note that there are people out there who, are, who might be doing similar things, have learned lessons and, and be really willing to share that information. So I think my key takeaway is, is to um, yeah, think about what other people are doing, build your networks and, and make connections and, and share that learning with other people. And actually maybe meet up with people for a coffee in real life now which would be marvellous, wouldn't it? Yeah. Cathy, over to you. Yeah, um, I, I don't really know where to begin and I'll try and summarise it in a blog as well for us at some point and you can share that with your networks. But I think I've, I've got some specific points around um, putting yourself in the shoes of other stakeholders. And I think we touched on that in the workshop um, with Kevin Murray and Irene Buterman in week three. Um, but also there was a really great idea in week two around collaborating with communities where um, someone suggested that we do some sort of work shadowing or job you know get, getting that insight from a local authority point of view as well as a community point of view and um to to actually get some understanding of what it's like the reality is on the ground essentially and I, I thought that was a really excellent idea um there was something for me around standardization of funding and so I think that reminds me of the one of the task force recommendations around aligning land reuse and sort of regeneration strategies with other strategies such as um community wealth building um housing and and you know getting this sort of cohesive um, approach to uh, land reuse and ensuring that that is, is led from the very top. And obviously there's, there's different and really creative ideas to ensure that um, leaders are taking this forward. Um, and I think that's another key takeaway for me is, is, is around leadership. And obviously today has demonstrated again that the public sector can lead on this and is leading on this across Scotland. 
yeah again just just hearing that message about relationship building and the role of local authorities in being able to act as that kind of broker to to connect people but also for all of us to go out and, and proactively make those connections and learn about what's what's happening elsewhere absolutely okay um Gemma I was going to ask you a bit more about the the guidance on land and community wealth building today um, obviously that was launched today and I was wondering what else people can do if they want to know a bit more about that what support is out there to to help them use it is there anything else that you want to kind of add on on that guidance for people yeah yeah there are a few things so obviously it, it's very new and you've spent the morning with us here and um, hearing some fantastic stories so after this I would suggest you go out and, and read the guidance have a look at what's in it and think about how you might be able to use it in your own organization um, if you, you check out our website, um, the link's just been posted in the chat there. We've got our resources and references list of, of lots of useful places you can go for further information. And um, we've also got some case studies that are, are shared on our website. Um, you can catch up on any land reuse month sessions you've missed. They will all be going on YouTube. You've, you've been told they're being recorded. So that's always helpful to, to find out what else is happening on uh, happening and going on and um, you can get in touch with us for advice, any questions, anything you want to know about it, we're always happy to answer questions and have a chat with you. And um, we will have some training and workshops to come out and they will be published um, via the appropriate organisations as, as things um, are confirmed. And um, we will also be looking at pulling together a self-evaluation cohort. So looking at uh, facilitating and really supporting organisations to evaluate what you're doing against what we've set out in the guidance. So that would be you know, support from us. It's about taking stock of where you are, identifying the, the really good things you have that you can share with other people and, and looking at what potential actions you can take and, and who you might work with for those, how you might um, you know, raise awareness and, and embed those things in your organisation. So lots and lots you can do around community wealth building. Thanks, Gemma. So people can get in touch with you if they want any kind of individual advice and also if they want to take part in this kind of action planning project, thinking about what they're doing, what kind of comes next. OK, fantastic. So we're going to wrap it up there then. It feels like it's been a, an epic um, journey in the planning for Land Reuse Month. And there are so many people that, that we could thank. Um, and, I, and I certainly want to do that. So all of our participants and speakers um, have been really fantastic and interesting. And the programme, for me anyway, has been really varied um, and I've really enjoyed that element of it. Behind the scenes, we've got Claire, Jess, Cathy uh, and the rest of the commission team, Gemma, Callum, all sorts of people, Sarah, helping out to, to ensure that all this works uh, smoothly and that, that everybody gets out of it what they want to get out of it. We have a, a link to an evaluation for the event that we will be posting. And if you're not already on our mailing list, then I encourage you to give us a nudge through info at landcommission.gov.scot to um, let us know that you'd like to be on that. And then as we've got more opportunities coming up, training and resources being published, then we can let you know as a, as a priority. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been a, a wonderful month and uh, I wish everybody the best with all of their projects and tackling land reuse in their communities. Putting people at the centre of our local economies is at the heart of community wealth building. Making sure that the control of assets and resources and the benefits they bring are in the hands of the local people can help keep the wealth generated in the local economy, creating a fairer, greener and more equal Scotland that empowers communities to bring about positive changes. How we own manage and use our land is key to community wealth building and forms one of five pillars of the approach. Spending, inclusive ownership, fair work, finance, land and property. These pillars help organisations to understand the changes they can make to build a strong local economy that works for everyone. Underpinned by the Scottish Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement, land and property is about owning and managing land and buildings in ways that grow the social, financial, environmental and economic value that local communities gain from the assets. Our guidance for public bodies that own, manage, use and influence the use of land and buildings in Scotland helps organisations to take actions that support community wealth building and contribute to 1. 
supporting net zero ambitions and sustainable development. Two, positive and proactive management of land and assets. Three, proactively tackling vacant and derelict land. Four, collaboration and partnership with communities and wider stakeholders. Five, supporting sustainable economic growth and community aspirations through more diverse ownership and management. Six, sharing information about land and buildings in an open and transparent way. Working to make more of Scotland's land for everyone. Find out more about land and community wealth building and check out our guidance and good practice case studies on our website at landcommission.gov.scot.